Good morning. My name is David Mansuri, President and CEO of Tennessee SCORE, and I'm really excited to welcome you to the release webinar for SCORE's latest report, Stopping Summer Melt, What Students Say and What Tennessee Can Do. This deep dive report into the issue of summer melt explores the primary barriers to post-secondary enrollment uh, and elevates the voices of young people from across Tennessee who disengaged from the education system after high school. Through conversations with students and college access partners, SCORE developed policy and practice recommendations aimed at reducing summer melt and addressing broader post-secondary issues, including entry, persistence, and completion. Today's webinar will begin with the presentation of the Stopping Summer Melt Report, and a walkthrough of the policy and practice recommendations made by SCORE. Then we'll transition to a panel discussion led by SCORE's post-secondary program and engagement manager, Dr. Sean Boyd, where we'll hear from partners about how they seek to address summer meld and how Tennessee can continue to improve supports for students to successfully transition from high school to post-secondary education. We'll then open things up for a brief uh, Q&A session before concluding our presentation around 11.50. First, I wanna take a minute to define what we mean by summer melt. So summer melt refers to when a student intends to go to college and takes preparatory steps to enroll, but ultimately disengages from the education system over the summer after high school graduation. Across the state of Tennessee, roughly 40% of high school seniors are impacted by summer melt affecting nearly 20,000 students each year. It's critical to note that this phenomenon disproportionately impacts our state students of color. In 2019, out of all students who applied for Tennessee Promise, but did not enroll in post-secondary education, 47% were black students and 51% were Hispanic students compared to only 38% of white students. So why should we pay attention to summer melt? Tennesseans who graduated high school in 2016 and did not pursue higher education earn less than $30,000 a year, whereas the median income for those who went on to earn a post-secondary degree at a two-year, four-year, or technical college is $45,000 a year, 1.5 times higher than those who did not earn a higher degree or credential. In addition to the wage premium of a degree or, uh, or certificate, individuals who complete a post-secondary credential on average are more civically engaged, are less likely to interact with the criminal justice system, and have overall better health outcomes over the course of their lives, all of which obviously have a positive impact on the state of Tennessee. In the first year of implementation of Tennessee Promise, the state's community colleges saw a significant 37% increase in enrollment. Tennessee Promise serves as a significant point of pride for Tennessee as it was the first statewide free college program in the country, representing a landmark policy for college access. Given that college enrollment rates have been steadily declining since the inception of Promise, we know that we have to continue passing innovative policies to support students to enter post-secondary education. In order to provide an unbiased look at how summer melt impacts Tennessee students, we focused on the high school graduating class of 2019 to ensure this research wasn't impacted by the unique and challenging moment facing students due to COVID-19. However, the immense impact of the pandemic on college going should not be understated. In the fall of 2020, for example, Tennessee saw a five point drop in college enrollment with the largest effects for students of color and students from low-income families. As we continue to grapple with the impact of COVID-19 on our education system, we must focus on providing students with the supports needed to be successful in K-12, college, and career. So to better understand the key barriers students face to college enrollment, SCORE partnered with Tennessee Achieves to reach college-intending students who graduated high school in 2019, but did not enroll in post-secondary the next fall. To narrow college intention, SCORE surveyed students who applied for Tennessee Promise and completed the FAFSA during their senior year, both key indicators of students' college-going intentions. 
through a process of surveys and focus groups, SCORE was able to identify common factors of at-risk students and elevate the experiences of these young people who are frequently overlooked and underserved. We found that roughly one third of college attending students in Tennessee are not successfully transitioning from high school to post-secondary with the highest rates for students who belong to historically underserved groups. 58% would have been first-generation college students. Nine in 10 students of color in the summer Mount cohort were economically disadvantaged. 66% were identified as academically underprepared for higher education based on their ACT scores. And white students were underrepresented in the summer Mount cohort relative, relative to graduating uh, to the graduating class of, uh, of students. This data shows us that the students who could benefit most from post-secondary education in Tennessee are not getting the support they need to enroll and persist toward a degree or credential. We as a state must do more to ensure these students can transition seamlessly, seamlessly through the education pipeline. So why does summer melt happen? SCORE analyzed the over 600 survey responses and highlighted four primary trends. First, delayed enrollment. Respondents who enrolled in higher education after the anticipated fall term. Second, disengaged. Respondents who indicated they were not interested in attending college and therefore still had not enrolled in post-secondary. Third, barriers to enroll. Respondents who indicated interest in attending college but have yet to enroll in any form of post-secondary. And fourth, TCAT waitlist. Respondents who plan to attend technical college but were identified in the MELT cohort due to extended time spent on the wait list. Following analysis of the survey responses, SCORE conducted virtual focus groups and provided longer open-ended surveys. In the end, yielding insights from 25 specific young people in Tennessee who shared their experiences in greater depth. From these conversations, three major themes emerged which are highlighted in the report through the eyes of students. And I wanna give some specific examples from, from three students now. First, Noah. Noah speaks on post-secondary affordability and access um, in reaching past tuition costs, sharing that, quote, even with Tennessee Promise, I simply couldn't afford to support myself and go to college. The system doesn't take into account that not everyone has family they can live with or have to help support them. If I could have rent or utility assistance so I could work part-time instead and balance school, then I would go to college in a heartbeat, end quote. Michaela talks about the barriers of extended time spent on TCAT wait lists after deciding to transfer out of the UT system to pursue a practical nursing license. Michaela struggle, struggles with the optics of a young person not currently pursuing higher education, stating, quote, people ask me where I'm going to school, it's embarrassing and I hate it. People don't think I'm doing anything with my life, end quote. In addition to the long wait list, Michaela experiences an additional barrier of fewer local opportunities. She mentions that, quote, there isn't much opportunity where I'm from. I'm really hopeful that the LPM program will open four doors for me, end quote. And finally, Salvador speaks to the importance of advising supports and post-secondary preparedness. He recalls feeling that he wasn't good enough for college because his grades weren't the best during his senior year, but now regrets not applying out of high school because navigating the application process as a first generation student without supports was incredibly challenging. With increased access to resources during the college enrollment process, the barriers faced by these three young people could have been avoided. If Noah received the completion grant, for example, to allow him to enroll in fall 2019 and use his Tennessee Promise Scholarship, he would have earned his degree or certificate by now and be ready to break into the workforce at a higher level. If Michaela's high school had a strong partnership with the local TCAT campus, she would have learned about the LPN program applied earlier and the time spent out of school would have been avoided. By now, Michaela would be a licensed nurse practitioner working in her field for over a year. And if Salvador's high school identified him as high risk for summer melt and provided additional advising and academic support at the high school level, he could have started his senior year with the confidence to apply for community college and persist with the assistance of Tennessee Achieve Summer Bridge Programming and post-secondary advising. Today, Salvador would be the first in his college to hold a college degree. Excuse me, first in his family to hold a college degree. 
With these powerful stories in mind, SCORE has identified five key recommendation areas to address summer melt, as well as broader post-secondary issues, including entry, persistence, and completion. These recommendations outline the shared responsibilities required to address these challenges with key roles for partners across the K-12 and higher education sectors. And, and importantly, try to identify who has responsibility for executing on some of these recommendations. So recommendation one, improve clarity for students, families, and educators about post-secondary opportunities and student progress towards these opportunities. A readiness indicator, for example, for ninth grade students should be adopted by the State Department of Education, the Office of Evidence and Impact to measure student progress towards post-secondary goals. TDOE should develop a district level process to notify parents and counselors when a student's below readiness standards. The State Board of Education should explore the potential of a new college and career advising licensure endorsement. The board should also strengthen the high school and beyond planning process. And the State Higher Education Commission should partner with the State Department of Education to provide enhanced professional development on using a college for TN platform to educators and counselors who, ser who serve as faculty advisors. Recommendation two, invest in high quality summer programs to decrease student remediation rate and support students between high school graduation and the fall semester of college. Tennessee should invest in scaling the Summer Institute model from Tennessee Achieves across Tennessee's community colleges. Currently offered at Southwest, the 10-week institute, which primarily serves low-income students of color, saw 100% of students test out of learning supports this year. Tennessee Achieves should also support districts and enroll more students in summer bridge support programs by offering real-time data insights on student eligibility and sign-up status. And THEC should offer grants to develop partnerships between institutions and local school districts focused on facilitating smooth transitions between high school and higher education. Recommendation three, support new high school graduates to attend TCATS by providing greater transparency about wait lists and better enrollment support. The Tennessee Board of Regents should strengthen data collection and public reporting about the TCAT application process and wait list system. We learned in our focus groups of students that when students apply for TCAT, they're not notified about their place on the wait list or how long they may be waiting before enrollment. More transparency is needed so students can understand program demand and expected delays to enrollment. TCATs should develop partnerships with local school districts to ensure students are equipped with transparent information on enrollment opportunities. And there should be a new effort to place more TCAT instructors in high schools where formal TCAT high school partnerships exist. Recommendation four, strengthen the Tennessee Promise Scholarship. School districts in Tennessee should prioritize eliminating barriers for students to complete community service requirements tied to Tennessee Promise. For many students who have significant work or personal responsibilities outside of school, or for those who do not have access to reliable transportation, identifying and completing service opportunities can be particularly burdensome. And the state should provide a funding mechanism for Pell eligible Promise students to cover additional costs to attend college. And finally, recommendation five, expand scholarship opportunities for students unable to enroll in higher education immediately after high school and not yet eligible for Tennessee to reconnect. TSAC rules should increase the maximum value for the Tennessee Student Assistance Award. 2019-20, TSAA offered aid to more than 64,000 students with an average award of roughly $1,600. Over half of scholarship recipients are first-generation enrollees, and 90% of recipients have a household income less than $40,000. So to dig into these recommendations further and discuss how summer melt impacts students in, uh, in Tennessee specifically, we'll now turn to a panel discussion moderated by Dr. Sean Boyd, SCORE's post-secondary program and engagement manager. Before coming to SCORE, Dr. Boyd served as the Associate Director of K-12 and Community Partnerships at Southwest Tennessee Community College in Memphis, working on targeted projects to reduce summer melt at the institution level. Good morning and thank you, David. I am so excited about the panel that we have before us this morning and I won't waste any time. Let me go ahead and introduce them to you. First, we have up Troy Grant. Troy is the Senior Director for College Access and Success for the Tennessee Higher Education Commission. Welcome, Troy. Up next, we have Ellie Silverman. She's a senior complete coach for Tennessee Achieves. Welcome, Ellie. 
third, we have Dr. Arita Summers. She's the president for Tennessee College of Applied Technology at Dixon. Welcome, Dr. Summers. And last but certainly not least, we have Mr. Jesse Turner. Jesse is the college access counselor at Lexington High School for the Heirs Foundation. Welcome you all this morning. We're gonna go ahead and get started with the panel discussion. In Tennessee, over 40% of high school graduates who take preparatory steps for college ultimately disengage from the education system each year. How have you seen summer melt affecting students in your role? And also from your perspective, what do you see as the primary barriers to post-secondary enrollment students face the summer after high school? And we're gonna go ahead and kick it off with Mr. Troy. Thanks, Sean. You don't have to call me Mr. Troy for sure. <laughs> um, I would say, um, and first and foremost, I think that summer melt is it's a real thing. I mean, we see it in our advising programs at Vice Tennessee, Gear Up Tennessee, where we have students who are most certainly impacted by summer melt. The 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 reality of it is there are life circumstances that happened uh, over the course of the summer um, that make it challenging for students to kind of move from what they intend to do to actually matriculating to higher education. In terms of what those barriers look like, you have a group of students who have been in a very structured environment who are oftentimes first time decision makers who are moving through a process, particularly for our first generation underrepresented students. Um, they're moving through a process that this is all new to them. They don't have life experience in this space. There's a vernacular uh, that is completely new and different and kind of navigating those waters um, that every step along Along the way, be it verification, being it um, how do I log into my banner system? These are all things that then, um, for some of our students, are barriers to them getting across the finish line. And I think that those are both like life events, um, but they're also kind of just the the way the machine works. And if I'm not oriented to the machine, it's very difficult for me to get across that finish line. Thank you for that, Troy. Ellie. Yeah, kind of building off of what Troy was talking about, I think one of the biggest barriers that I see working with students during their transition from high school to college is simply a lack of confidence in what they should be doing at the college level. Um, many of these students have a support system in high school while they're applying for Tennessee Promise and maybe while they're getting started in the college going process. But once they hit that graduation mark, if they don't already have a point of contact that they are familiar with um, at the college that they're planning on attending, that's where that lack of confidence comes in and they don't really feel capable of doing things on their own. And if they're not able to get in contact with their college counselors anymore, or if they haven't already built those relationships either with Tennessee Achieve staff or mentors or people at their college, um, that is kind of when we see them disengage. Um, also, I think that the college going process can sort of feel like a foreign language to a lot of students, specifically first generation college students. And if they don't have someone there to help them navigate and translate these different things, it can be incredibly frustrating and discouraging as they try to make what should be a really exciting transition in their life. Um, every day I help students understand emails from their college, just figuring out what different holds might mean, what different requirements are. And if they don't feel comfortable reaching out to someone and they don't already know the answer, that's when they also start to maybe think that the college going process is too difficult and maybe they wouldn't be a good fit. And that's kind of, that's kind of where that summer melt disconnect comes into. Thank you, Ellie. Dr. Summers, if you want to add anything to that. Dr. Summers, I think you're on mute, I'm sorry. You know, from the college perspective, we um, always are, are trying to identify the students that had interest but did not materialize. For me, being in the Complete Tennessee Leadership Institute last year helped me learn about summer melt because that was not a term that I was familiar with. Um, we knew that we had this population of students, but we didn't really have a way to identify or to say, okay, now that we've named this problem, how do we go about solving it? 
for us, we are partners with Clarksville Montgomery County School System and Austin P and Nashville State. And we're coming together to identify the students that were interested in enrolling, but didn't actually materialize in the fall. And as I look at that, that is helping me with that group of students, but I have seven more counties. How do I roll that out to all of our students and not just that one county? So uh, it's very, very interesting to make sure that we don't leave anyone out. I'm sorry, I'm muted. Uh, Jesse, did you have anything to add to that question? Yes, uh, outside of circumstances that could pop up between May and September when we could see, and we certainly see these things happen, there could also be logistical barriers that are snowballing from the very beginning um, that we will try to chisel down, but students may not let us help them with those tools. Things like poor financial planning. You know, maybe their aspirations are so high and we try to point them in the direction of where um, financial aid could help them the most um, because we know that there's not financial aid backing and the home system to help them with that. Um, this could be responsibilities that they have at their home that they're afraid to separate from, you know, like, oh, I need to help support um, this household. I'm expected to work. Um, this could be very low expectations from the family as well. And that is very disheartening to hear parents speak of their own students and say, I didn't go to college. They don't need to go to college. Um, I did just fine without any of this. They'll be just fine without any of this. And then I think probably our number one barrier we see is just transportation. Um, as far as we're in a rural high school and um, even something that is 10 minutes down the road is not walking distance. Um, so I've, I've not seen someone who doesn't have a car in high school, not say that they're saving for a car in high school, but not many are able to follow through on that because they're not able to work without a car. So it's, it's just one barrier after another. And so you wanna help them kind of um, push through that pile, but so many circumstances um, that were present in the beginning of the year, maybe bad home life, maybe you know things like this that we try to identify early on could indicate you know, summer melt is, is a large potential or a larger potential with this, with this population. Thank you, Jesse. And again, I'm hearing the, that partnerships really matter between our secondary and post-secondary um, 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 sectors, because again, many of our students, especially first generation college, again, it's a whole different world. Um, I remember talking to a student just knowing the days of the week to go to class um, you know, on your schedule when it says MW or, or T or TR. Of course, us working at a college setting, we know what that means, but for a student, it's completely foreign. And so, like you said, um, really having those partnerships in place can make a world of difference. Thank you for that um, feedback for question one. I just wanna remind the audience that we are taking questions. At the bottom of your, sc your screen, you will see a Q&A option. Please put your questions in and toward the end of the panel, we would definitely um, get to some of those. Our second question, in 2015, Tennessee saw community college enrollment soar with the first cohort of Tennessee Promise. Though enrollment has consistently declined in recent years, despite access to tuition-free community college, many students are not successfully enrolling. Troy, what levers do you see at the state level to provide the key student supports needed in addition to Tennessee Promise to be successful? And are there opportunities to strengthen the program to better support students who are traditionally underrepresented? Yeah, so I think it's all about advising. Um, advising is one of those terms that I think means everything and nothing, uh, depending on where you're coming from. And so I think as a state, we need to get really clear on what we mean when we say that we're advising students around career and college. And I think really getting clear too on what are the competencies that make a student, a high school student, career and college ready. And then very intentionally from a very vertical perspective, thinking about 
where in the K-12 experience do those things live? What grades do they live in? Who is responsible for those things? In the same that we talk about building math skills over K-12, we need to build very intentionally these competencies around college and career readiness um, in a very intentional way that students aren't just getting to that finish line understanding that, and they do know, um, students know the right answer to the question, what are you doing next year? They know that the right answer is I'm going to college, but do they know why they're going to college? Do they understand how all of these things kind of fit together in this patchwork? And so I think really getting clear about what those competencies are, where they fall in the student's experience and who's responsible for them. And then once they graduate, pitching together really solid summer bridge programming and connective tissue, if you will, between the high school experience and that college experience. I think that the work that Tennessee Achieves does in partnership with TEC and the community colleges, it kind of like building that kind of connective tissue. And there's a lot of other examples of colleges going to high schools and kind of building that kind of piece. So there's this continuity um, that helps students navigate um, those pieces. So I think it's that summer bridging and then also getting really clear on advising and expanding really good advising in that last stretch. Um, so making sure that there's someone who's really responsible, whether it be a program like Advice to the or the school counseling staff, whoever it might be, who is going to help that student navigate um, that process in those last kind of two years of college or high school. Thank you, Troy. And again, beginning with the end in mind is so key for our students. Um, and so like you said, with, you know, having students to know what the end looks like and how or what steps they need to take to get there. Um, it's very important in really helping students to transition from secondary to post-secondary. Ellie, how does Tennessee Achieves offer additional supports for Promise students to keep students from experiencing summer milk? We offer quite a few different, um, different ways to support our students to prevent experiencing summer melt. I think most well-known probably are um, our summer bridge programs, which Right now we offer three different summer bridge programs to keep all of our students engaged throughout the summer and help them build that confidence and feel more prepared to start their fall semester. Um, this year we had an in-person summer bridge program online and our summer institute. Um, and during all three of these programs, students have the opportunity to work with actual college professors, some of which they might actually have during their fall semester. They get to build relationships with other students who potentially and most likely will be their classmates in the fall, and they can increase their confidence on a college campus. Um, they'll know the names of buildings while they're on campus, and they kind of get to take those first steps and become familiar with their college prior to all of the students being there during the fall semester. Um, some students this year even shared with us running the programs that they felt like they had learned more being on their college campus during a short three week summer program than they did during virtual learning in the pandemic. So I think being able to kind of bridge that gap really helped make them feel like, okay, maybe I didn't feel so great about this past year, but I feel really good and confident about being able to start in the fall. Um, for a lot of students, it can even be the deciding factor. So our summer programs, we all love them at Tennessee Achieves. They're a great way for students to prevent that summer melt. Um, but our Tennessee Achieves students are also all paired with one of our volunteer mentors who helps serve as an additional layer of support and a resource for our students as they do navigate that transition from high school to college. Um, and they're paired with them during the spring semester of their senior year of high school. So they can build that relationship while they're still in school and use them as a resource during that summer where maybe they're not sure who to, who to turn to, whether it's their high school counselor, their college, they can talk to their mentor. Um, and then finally, this year, we actually just launched um, statewide complete grants for students um, targeted for our low income students. And it allows them to receive up to $1,000 per semester or $625 per trimester to help eliminate those additional barriers, whether it is, you know, transportation to and from the college, basic needs, housing, books, supplies, all those sorts of things. So we're really excited to offer that to our students this year as well. Thank you, Ellie. And like you said, with the completion grants, it's really gonna be a game changer 
Um, sometimes we take it for granted, you know, students, if you, if you have a flat tire to even make it to the campus um, can be a huge barrier and students really um, staying in, in, in that semester and ultimately graduating. So again, I think that's going to be a huge game changer for our students in completion. Up next in our survey of class of 2019 high school graduates, we found that just over 50% of students who apply for Promise and completed FAFSA did not attend to pursue higher education. Troy, how can we better build a college going culture into the K through 12 experience so that students see the benefits of post-secondary? I think that the work around this topic can't start in the junior and senior year. Um, it really has to start earlier. And you kind of, I think that um, students understand, like I said before, that um, the correct answer to what are your plans for next year is going to college. But I don't know that all students understand why. Um, we as a state, and I don't think this is a bad thing at all, we've done a really good job of operationalizing some of the, the milestones in that junior and senior year. We have excellent uptake of Tennessee Promise application. We lead the country in FAFSA filing. These are all great things, um, and it's something a point of pride. But when you get to that finish line, you don't know why it is that you're making this jump and investing this time. Then that's where it, when life hits you or barriers hit you, the kind of, it just all kinds of falls apart. Um, and so I think that my response to that question would be thinking about how we can start earlier and really emphasizing why, um, why this is an important thing to do um, after the student graduates. Thank you, Troy. Across our focus groups, we heard from many students that they didn't start thinking about college until their senior year when it was too late to really explore their options and make the best decision for themselves. Jesse, when should students start thinking about college with a trusted counselor or educator? What is the benefit of identifying students early who are most at risk for summer milk? Um, I would say as early in the high school process as possible. Uh, we at the Air Foundation, we actually start with eighth grade classrooms. And so that is, I mean, this past spring, we went on a spring tour of sorts. We partnered with middle school counselors we went and visited middle schools and at these middle schools we're not you know meeting with them individually we're just presenting to them as, as a group um, basic financial aid um, uh, prospects we're talking about programs in our state we're talking about um, that tennessee promise is not just for your local area it can be used across the state you know th just these very basic things getting them familiar with our faith and our program so that they know they can come see us at high school we're talking to them at future freshman nights and then the, the biggest thing that we're establishing, because eighth graders love to make jokes, eighth graders love to kind of joke around and stuff. Um, but something that we, <laughs> we start on a very serious note is explaining to them that Tennessee is really ahead of the curve in the college access game. This is, this is not um, a backward state. This is not what you might think of as, as Southern um, because of the opportunities that we have. So just starting them off and saying, I know some of you want to go out of state and we'd love to help you do that but we wanted you to be aware of the amazing opportunities we have in state to help you attend school, pay for school, you know, remove barriers, things like that. Um, and so we're meeting with them night through senior year as well with, with just targeted programs. These could be classroom visits. These could be our college fairs. We have a college summit the junior year. Um, all of this kind of snowballing up to their senior year where they're already familiar with us by this point. They, they know our faces, they know our program. And uh, as far as identifying um, students that were a potential for summer melt, we, we don't do this as formally uh, as we hmm. could. I don't know that that's a, a problem for us as far as identifying. We do, though, will mark off certain warning marks. Like if a student, we ask very early in the senior year, you know, if, if, if someone's under guardianship, we, we want to mark that student down because a they're going to have a longer financial aid process we need to make sure proper paperwork's in order but we also want to know that that housing is stable we want to know if 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 that student needs to be declared homeless we need to do that earlier before they turn 18 when our options are limited um you know if they're not with parents we need we need to know these things to help them create that narrative for their financial aid paperwork we don't want them to say I, I did see mom two months ago because now they're going to need mom's information so we want to make sure that we're helping them know um, just what they're up against. Transparent communication is always the student's best weapon. If they don't know, 
then they can't succeed and they don't know what they don't know. So just helping them to know this is very typical, this is very usual, and we're prepared to help you with this. This is nothing we haven't seen. That reassures students a lot. Hmm. Very good to hear, Jesse. And I like how you mentioned it, it's just 20 minutes a year for the most part, starting with that ninth grade year and how it really can make a world of difference. Um, just a quick follow-up question. I know working with the high school counselors, have you had any pushback or do they welcome you to come in to really work with those students? No, we, we are, um, we're very aware that we're an intrusion on their time. So we try to make this an intentional and strategic intrusion. intrusion. And so far at my schools, at the middle schools and high schools, we have had zero pushback. They love the help. They understand we're not here to take their job. We're here to add on to their work and really show them afterward too. show them the statistics of their students saying, hey, you train this. This is these are your students, your fruit going on to be successful adults. And that really kind of reassures them as well that their work is not in vain, you know, that they're seeing successful students and what we're doing to help those that are not successful. That's also important to them as well. So with that, they, they know early on that we're trying to be a strong partner for them to help carry the load into post-secondary spaces. Really great to hear. Thank you, JC. Dr. Summers, how can high schools and post-secondary institutions develop partnerships to ensure a seamless transition for students? I think that the very best thing we can do is to spend time communicating with one another, um, taking the time to meet regularly to discuss the who's in the students that are succeeding because what is celebrated is repeated, right? So what is working? But also to identify what is not working, who is not going on, and what is the reason why. Some of the conversations that we've had have led us to things such as an early technical high school with um, two counties. And, you know, that's just beneficial. It was a need for the school system and we had the opportunity to fill that. So it was a natural fit. Uh, being partners in LEAP grants and then now into the GIVE grants and applying for the GIVE 2.0s. A lot of conversation goes in there to identify these needs and then how can we pull our resources and efforts to solve those solutions. Other items I think that's very important is when working with counselors, um, they don't always understand some of the TSAC policies and applying for dual enrollment grants. What is a consortium agreement when I've got a student who wants to go to two different institutions at the same time? And so often the post-secondary institution has the majority of that information. But if I'm not taking ample time to discuss that with them, then they don't know how to counsel their students. So my biggest advice is be willing to spend time speaking with one another throughout the year, not just at the beginning of the school year or at the end. And I agree, Dr. Summers, as we mentioned earlier, it can be foreign for our students to understand post-secondary, but many times our, our leaders and our counselors, it's, it's a lot for them to understand as well. At Southwest, we will host a guidance counselors brunch every year. And at that brunch, we would take time to explain dual enrollment or you know, what's new with financial aid this year or what's even new with different scholarships. So they would have the knowledge and they can really share with their students. So I definitely agree with what you're saying, really having that knowledge and really sharing it with our secondary institutions would definitely be key in really helping our students to transition during the summer. Thank you. Absolutely. Many of our students uh, we surveyed experience enrollment delays after high school due to extended time on the TCAT program wait list. Jesse, how does AIR support students to navigate the TCAT enrollment process of those who are on the wait list to ensure successful enrollment? Apologize, my bell was ringing. Uh, yes, communication, communication. Like I, I cannot stress this enough, over communicating to our students um, about how the process is being as transparent as we can, reassuring them that any wait list that they're on is very typical, warning them on the upfront, saying, hey, this may not start in the fall semester for you, this could be January. And kind of judging by their reaction, how important that is to them to start in the fall, 
uh, if, a, if a program is essential to them, then they'll wait for January. But if they're open to many other programs, I'm taking advantage of that opportunity to say, apply to as many programs as you're interested in. I'm also very lucky that I'm within a stone's throw of about three to four TCAT campuses, whether that be extensions or separate um, systems. And I tell them, if this is something that's at multiple campuses, we need to apply to multiple campuses. And staying in a targeted communication with them throughout the summer um, is very essential as well. Um, establishing that um, email is a very primary form of communication from the TCAT system. And a lot of my students are not familiar with email to begin with. You know, this may be their only email address is their school email. And I have to warn them, hey, this gets deleted like the day of graduation. So let me help you create a primary in, like, private email address that you can put in now. Let's check it. Let's make sure we get this checked. You know, if they have a smartphone, uploading it to their smartphone, things like that. Um, anything we can do to once again, reassure them with transparent conversation that this is normal and I'm here with you and, and you can keep asking me and I'll keep telling you, hey, it's okay. We're on the wait list. I, you know, trying to get that transparency because we can't reassure them where they're at on the wait list. We don't have that in front of us. And I understand that our local TCAS around us are also dealing with that as well. It's almost like a clog in the drain uh, of what COVID has caused. So we're just trying to be patient with both the student and the TCAS system. Thank you, Jason. I like how you mentioned communication and really meeting students where they are. Um, and so not only, you know, hey, we got to check our email email daily and not only looking at your school email, but personal emails and also text messaging. We know every student has cell phones and really having that communication um, option open for our students. Um, Dr. Summers, importantly, Governor Lee invested millions this past legislative session to reduce the TCAT wait lists so that students can enroll in technical education in a timely manner. From your perspective as a TCAT leader, what opportunities do you see to ensure students can move more easily and understand program availability and wait list expectations? So we are very thankful to our legislature and to the governor for investing uh, 54 million into the TCAT system for reducing the wait list. And we're calling this the capacity initiative. How do we increase the capacity of who we can serve? Most uh, in the school systems know that we already go year round. We are um, open entry, open exit. We have about 12 start dates a year. So when a student masters all their competencies, we graduate them so we can immediately get someone back into that spot and get them on their way. But even with all of these efforts to move people through as quickly as we can, technical education in and of itself is very time constrained. It's very manual. It takes time to build welding skills or to attend clinical. So what we do um, typically is try to um, increase our opportunity in the sense of evening classes and um, looking at our individuals and where are we offering our sessions? How do we increase students as dual enrollment so that they get a head start on it? And if they start as a head start, not only are they getting introduced to college, but it also means that they're gonna graduate earlier, which means that there'll be a, a, a faster turnover in that system. Um, adding equipment. Uh, so that we could potentially even increase the size of day classes. So all of these are things that we're doing as part of that capacity initiative. Thanks, Dr. Summers. And I, I think I just learned something. And you just mentioned if students are on the or enrolling dual enrollment in high school, they can get on a waiting list earlier. Is that correct? Actually, um, every TCAT is um, independent. Uh, we are part of the Tennessee Board of Regents, but we all have individual relationships with our school systems and, and each has their own unique ways of doing things. Okay. Particularly for TCAT Dixon and Clarksville and our other uh, counties that we serve, if a student dual enrolls with TCAT Dixon, they go right to the top of the wait list. 
So we consider them a continuing education student and not a new student. So they go to the top. However, a student who did not dual enroll with us and maybe waits until July to get on the waiting list, now they're going to go in place because there are adults who are also trying to get in and trying to support their families and they also need these skill sets. So we try to get the counselors to help those students that are not dual enrolling, but are interested in attending a TCAT to get on that wait list at the beginning of their senior year. So by doing so, they will be at the top of the list. They will have waited that time perhaps along with the other adult students. So there's a couple of options. Dual enroll, go to the top. Don't dual enroll, get on the list early. Great information, thank you. You're welcome. The majority of students in 2019 summer milk cohort were academically underprepared to enter post-secondary. Tennessee Achieves offers summer bridge programming at every community college in the state that offers academic supports to prepare students for college. Ellie, I know you touched on this a little bit earlier, but with these bridge programs, um, particularly the Summer Institute in Memphis, are highly effective at preparing students most at risk for MELT. What do you see as the key factors that make these programs so impactful for students? I think there are many key factors that help play a role for success. Um, I think I talked about this a little bit earlier, but working with actual college professors really helps to give these students realistic expectations of what college is actually going to be like when they start in the fall. And it alleviates some of those what if fears that students may build up over the summer if they're not taking any classes or aren't taking any big strides in their college career. Um, and as part of this program, students all have the opportunity to get learning support classes and those remedial classes out of the way. And in the case of Summer Institute, they actually um, start earning college credit during that program. And I think that being able to start with college experience and college credit hours under their belt really helps propel them into their college career. Um, I think it's a lot less likely for a student to earn nine or 10 credit hours over the summer and then decide that they no longer want to enroll in the fall semester. Um, and this was mentioned earlier, but 100% of Summer Institute participants this year tested out of and passed all of their classes, which was huge and I just think speaks to the success of the students. Um, but being able to also just see kind of where they started versus where they've ended the program, you know, 100% of them passed their classes. If that's, if that's not a confidence boost to show them that they can participate in college classes and be successful, I don't know what is. Um, so that is really exciting. Like I said, building confidence early on is a huge factor in getting them through the door. Um, and one of the other things that was touched on a little bit throughout the panel has also been students not necessarily having the knowledge or resources needed to maybe complete requirements to actually attend. Um, but one of the requirements for the Summer Institute program to participate is actually getting admissions and financial aid requirements completed ahead of time. So they work with Tennessee Achieve staff prior to ever starting those Summer Institute courses and they get all of those requirements out of the way. Um, which can definitely be a challenge for a lot of students participating in the program. But once they're done with Institute, they are essentially all tied up and ready to start their fall semester. Um, those students also get to work with college student mentors at Southwest, um, which is different from any other experience they've really had with college thus far. Um, you know, they have their Tennessee Achieves mentors, our staff, the college staff, but getting to work with a student that actually goes to Southwest, a lot of times they're probably more comfortable asking them questions and they can just build a relationship. And if nothing else, they know a familiar face on campus in the fall too. Um, so I think that that makes a really big difference as well. Um, so, I mean, as you mentioned, Summer Bridge is offered all across the state, but Institute right now is just in Memphis. 
Um, but we are so looking forward to having the opportunity at some point to really expand Institute across the state. I mean, 100% success, I think, is, is huge for those students. Ellie, I could not agree with you more. I got a chance by working at Southwest um, to pilot that first summer Institute with Tennessee Achieves and just saw some amazing things happen that summer. I loved it so much, I actually did my dissertation um, for my doctorate program on Summer Institute and looking at student engagement, um, sense of belonging, and of course, persistence. And out of all three categories, we saw a significant difference. And so as you just mentioned, if we can host this program across the state, I mean, it would be a huge game changer. So definitely appreciate um, your efforts with Summer Institute and all the Summer Bridge programs that Tennessee Chiefs does. All right, we will continue on. A big part of understanding getting students ready for their post-secondary goals is having the data to understand where they are and what additional supports they need. Troy, in your opinion, how can a state level organization support getting schools and educators the data they need? And what do you feel or what data is most important? So I don't, more data is not always better data. I think it's really important to curate the data. And I think that there's a lot of data that's available, um, but are not getting into the hands per se of the practitioner on the ground level. Um, and so I think that the way, there's a couple of thoughts that I have about the ways that we can do that and the way that we are doing that. We are about to launch a brand new version of collegefortn.org, um, which will have profiles for all Tennessee institutions. We'll have career uh, profiles that will be tied to ONET. Also, all of the financial aid information that TEC and TSAC put out will reside on that website. So it's all gonna be really a one-stop shop. We're also going to have resources though for school counselors. And so I think creating this kind of like hub and spoke kind of like one location where all of these things converge um, will be powerful. Um, I also think that there is an opportunity to do something similar to what we've done with FAFSA in this state. I mean, you know, in 2016 organizations and, you know, like the ones represented here, um, uh, ARS Foundation, Tennessee Achieves, our organization got together and said, like, how can we really empower um, practitioners across the state with data and but also strategies. Data in and of itself is not helpful if there isn't some kind of like framework to, to think about how you can use that information and strategies you can leverage to then make a difference. And so we've been able to push out to high schools, for instance, where they are in FAFSA filing, give them the tools that they need to log into the FAFSA system and see what students they need to really focus on in on during that FAFSA season. I think we can do similar things for college going. I think it would be very powerful to to help a school look you know and here's an example we always talk about on my team is that we partnered with a high school we visited that high school and they're like yeah our college going rate is 95 percent um well their college going rate was not 95 percent um that's what the number of that you know that's when they did their senior exit survey when they're in the graduation line and or at practice and again like i said everyone knows the right answer to that question um, so getting getting just the awareness of if I'm a high school, what is my college going rate? What does success for my graduates look like? And if I can disaggregate that by a couple of different demographic groups and really see who are the students that were not serving as well as we could. And then coming back behind that, providing the resources, the strategies to then do something about it. Um, and I think that that's where, so I don't know that I think that more data is per se helpful. I think data with contacts um, disaggregated so that we can really target um, interventions to students um, and then with strategies and a framework um, to kind of build upon that. I think it's really powerful. I also think that scores recommendation around a, a early indicator so we can provide some transparency that's not just, um, you know, there are times where data is informative and then there are times where data is like a postmortem and you kind of just see like who didn't make it. Um, I think if we can kind of get some level of data earlier where we can then identify those students interventions, um, but then also help schools really understand really where they are and moving the needle along these metrics. I think that would be powerful. Very great information. Thank you, Troy. COVID-19 had a significant impact on college going in Tennessee with a five-point drop in overall college going impacts on students of color and low-income students. For the entire panel, if you could make one suggestion, how can the K-12 and higher education systems work together 
to offer coordinated support to students who may have disengaged after high school to enroll. And we will kick it off with Ellie. Um, I think that it would be extremely helpful for um, K-12 partners to help us in identifying their own students who would benefit most from summer programs like Bridge, like Institute, those sorts of things, and really help to encourage their students to apply early and also to educate their parents um, of what supports are out there and available to their students to help kind of get them across that finish line. And also, Ellie, I was going to add to that when we talk about parents and with the summer bridge programs, how can we get more students involved in those? We see the great um, benefits of being in those summer institutes and summer bridge programs. Do you have any suggestions on how we can maybe get more students involved? I think notifying them early on about the program and really um, utilizing our high school counselor partners to motivate students to want to participate. Summer Institute is a little bit of a longer program. Um, we shortened it this year, but typically it's pretty much the entire summer, which we know can be a harder sell to students than our normal three week bridge program. Um, so I think really getting buy in from the high school counselors that partner with Institute. And I do think working with parents is huge in that space as well. We survey all students after they participate in the program and prior, and we typically ask them you know, list all the reasons why you've participated in the summer program. And regardless of other options, most of them always um, also indicate that their parents encouraged them to sign up and participate. So I think getting parent buy-in and helping them understand what the program does for their students, you know, not only does it prepare them for college, but specifically institute, they are going into college with college credit hours. I think getting a parent buy-in from counselors can be helpful too, because they know us from Tennessee Achieves emails, but at the end of the day, they probably have a more familiar relationship with their high school and the counselors. Very key, thank you. Jesse? Outside of the dream space of affordable housing and transportation for TCATs and community colleges, um, I feel like a cost-effective strategy we could take as a task force that uh, continually engages students um, to offer them consistent validation that they are um, able, that they have the potential for more um, and enables them to maybe hear that from a different perspective or another trusted resource. So if they don't listen to me, uh, maybe it's a teacher that they have grown fond of, a mentor within the school system, a school counselor, all of us coordinating our efforts um, to students that are marked with that early indicator that they need more consistent engagement because of anything going on at home, family issues, financial problems, and things like that. Jesse, I agree. Just using um, um, pretty much everyone at the school, it, it, really, it really helps. So having a guidance counselor or maybe a teacher, um, just someone that they can trust and really go to and have those um, questions answered and really help them to navigate um, is, is very key. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Summers. Yeah, I think that the best way to work within this issue is to try to solve the problem before it begins. When they are in high school, we have a collective audience. They are there, they are together. And if we can introduce them to dual enrollment, they may find that what they thought they were interested in, they really weren't. Now, when they do go to college after high school, maybe they're not going to be that career changer, you know, that major changer. Um, once they have graduated, if they have not had some of that engagement, it's like, they have spread their wings and we're trying to herd butterflies. You don't know how to get them. You don't know how to um, interest them at that point. So my thought is have more programs. We just started a free practical nursing program with two school systems and you know, broaden the scope of what we're offering to attract more of these students. Um, what we do not want it the TCATs is another student like Michaela who is sitting on that waiting list and she is um, 
in appearance to those around her that she's not doing anything when really she's done everything she could at that point to apply. And especially if she's going into a cohort class like nursing or dental um, surgical technology, you know, they only start certain times of the year. And so how do we increase our capacity to serve these individuals immediately upon high school? So I, I think that's how I would start is just start early and uh, try to solve it before they graduate. Great. And one more thing to mention, I know that most TCATs offer stackable credentials, yes. um, and which is key. Um, do you mind talking about that a little bit and maybe how students can celebrate those small wins? Um, Absolutely. So stackable credentials are where students are able to reach certain milestones after completing a series of competencies. And I would say nearly all of my particular programs have something after the first four months and maybe again at eight months or 12 months. And they start out as certificates and then they become diplomas. And I will give an example that when I was at Nashville, we had a partnership with Vanderbilt with the Next Steps program. And these were students with intellectual disabilities. And of course, we are an open access institution. So we take people with a broad set of skills and abilities. But some of these students weren't trying to become a master level automotive technician, but can they work in a parts? department or can they work in an office as um, a receptionist so the goal is to help students get as far as they can with the skill sets that they have and then the second way is what if I've gotten halfway through a program but life has happened right I my spouse lost his job so now I have to go to work to help support the family or I've become sick whatever the case might be and now I have to move it's not like an associate degree or a bachelor's degree where it's maybe all or nothing. With this, you would get the awards or credentials that go with what you've actually completed. So I take out some marketable skills that I can use, and then that serves as a place marker. And when life comes back around and I'm able to re-enter the TCAT, I can go back and finish the rest of those diplomas. Great information. Thank you, Dr. Summers. Troy? You're very welcome. Yeah, sure. So I think there's two things that come top of mind. One is, I think if we as a state could think about how we, um, we have a lot of institutions who handle some of this matriculation process very differently and to what degree we can standardize some of the practices so that at a statewide level we can build competency amongst our school counseling and advising staffs across the state so that we can better help students navigate these waters. I think that would be a huge win. Um, to what degree we can make this a more efficient process, a more seamless one and one that is more uniform across institutions would be a powerful thing. And the other thing is, is that, you know, when students and high school students are in school, they're, for lack of a better word, they're captive, right? They're there, they're in a structured time, they show up every day. Every high school across the state has one to three institutions that are the primary feeders, like where they send their students, be it the local TCAT, community college, a four-year institution. Partnering with those feeder institutions, as informed by data, so that you can bring some of the things that happen at orientation and the things that do catch students um, um, in that summer and kind of cause them to melt, bringing those things into the senior year before they leave that building while they have that support, I also think would be a powerful way of reducing uh, this challenge across the state. And Troy, I couldn't agree with you more. I, at Southwest, we actually did a similar program. And like you said, while they, we have their attention, they're in their high school, we actually took new student orientation to some of our top feeder high schools. And at that time, we were able to collect their documents, um, transcripts. Um, we had our financial aid team to show up in a computer lab. We had our career services department to come and talk to our students about different certificates or different degrees transfer pathway. And by the time students left that day, they had a schedule in hand. Um, financial aid was complete. Um, their admissions requirements were complete and they were ready to go for the fall semester. And even during the summer, 
um, when we know students do melt out, uh, we made sure to keep kept you know keep them engaged with an ice cream social one month. Or we did a student panel the next month where, um, where students came on campus um, to really hear those panels, um, a tour of the campus. Um, and we seen, we actually saw some really great numbers from just really bringing our services to that high school. Um, and like you said, really having a captive audience while they were there. So very, very key. Nothing, nothing, uh, nothing addresses stress better than a plan, mm -hmm. right? Um, mm -hmm. And so I think that that's helpful for the kid and the student. But also I think for the colleges, um, that kind of mad rush that we have over at the end of the summer, the time and energy it takes to kind of accomplish all these tasks and not a follow up, it would be a win for the institutions as well. Exactly, exactly. Well, we're gonna take some questions from our chat. I think we have a few here. Um, Tiffany mentioned, or she's asking, how are post-secondary institutions and partners focusing efforts to address the equity gaps due to some amount of Black and Latin students. And we know earlier, David mentioned that there is a gap um, when it comes to students of color. Do you, anyone mind talking about maybe some of the um, targeted, targeted um, outreach that they're doing for those, for students of color? So I'll be happy to just say a couple of words on that. We have recently become an achieving the dream. Um, school and that has made a difference in how we are looking as Troy said at our data uh, really good data and trying to understand and, and achieving the dream provides a mentor for us right so they have worked in this a long time and they help us see some areas and then we are working to really look at these categories, these demographics of students, but the Tennessee Board of Regents is also doing a Black Male Success Initiative and really focusing on how COVID um, has really impacted this population and group. So there's a lot of work being done about that, around that, and we're very happy to uh, see what happens in, in this next year and how we improve at the end of, of these efforts. And Dr. Summers, I'm glad you mentioned that um, the, the African American Male Institute, I'm glad to be on that working group as well. Um, and we are, we have some great things um, coming up for those students to really close that gap um, this, this fall. So definitely um, appreciate you mentioning that. Anyone else have any um, thing that they would like to mention from the organization or? I Go ahead, Ellie, I'm sorry. Yeah, I can touch on something quickly. It was, it's specific to Nashville State, but during the bridge program that we held at Nashville State, we had various organizations come and talk to students, but one of them being, it's it's called CORE. Um, and we had a speaker come and essentially talk to our students, but it's designed for African-American students. And it's open to all African-American students, but specifically male students to help them form a cohort while they're at college and just to kind of help them with different challenges that they may face. Um, they try to get them in classes together, things like that to really help form a community um, and to help them feel supported as well. So we were able to have them come and speak to our students and kind of recruit from the bridge program too, which was exciting for them because I mean, these are students who are proactive in their education. So it's exciting to be able to give them that opportunity as well. Thanks for sharing. John, I would say this is less from a college perspective. It's really more from the access or kind of side. I mean, our our advice in the Sea and Garrett program, Sharika Nelms, Dwayne Gregg, um, they're really doing some work around looking at our data and better understanding where our gaps are um, from the high school perspective, not just on who is going, but also in terms of service delivery. I mean, there's a lot of there are times at which you do a college access program and you have a um, if you build it, they will come. Well, the kids who are going to come are the kids who are going to go. Um, and so we've been talking a little bit about if not for, if not for this intervention, this student would not cross the finish line and identifying those students and being really proactive about designing interventions and targeting interventions where we go get those students, I think is a key piece. And I think that some of where that kind of democratizing some of the data could be very helpful. Very key. Thank you, Troy. 
Uh, Jesse, we have just a quick question for you about the Ayers Foundation. Um, someone mentioned that it's somewhat of a different model than Tennessee Achieves. How important is the relationship that you, I guess, Ayers Foundation have with post-secondary partners? Oh, that is, that is absolutely essential. Um, having a partner at a school um, not only benefits us, uh, but it benefits a partner at the school. So if I'm speaking to a student that is absolutely anxious about financial aid, they are in an appeal process and they're just like, I, I've received this email and I have no clue what I'm doing. For me to tell that student, no worries, let me reach out to Miss Lori. And so I can name a person that I'm familiar with that I work with often. And I can say, let me reach out to Miss Lori for further clarification on what she's asking of you. And Ms. Lori and I have worked together, so she knows that I have permission to speak about the student. She knows that I have form signed. And then I can assist that student to kind of be that middleman to decipher that vernacular that we've talked about, that students do not understand. What does verification mean? What does this appeal mean? Um, but it doesn't just apply to financial aid. It also applies to housing. You know, if I can say, I need to reach out to Caitlin in housing because you and your roommate now uh, don't like each other and so we need to move a room something like this or any other department but it also helps on the uh, organization side because if I can save them 30 to 45 minutes of time so that they can address the hundreds of other students that don't have someone like me to help remove their barriers you know if I can if I can help them um, because as you know if you if you worked with financial aid between May and August they have enough going on. They, they don't, any help that they can receive is, is well welcome. And so just acknowledging that on the partners end too. I'm, whenever I talk to a partner, I, I am not going, hey, you messed up this student. No, no, hey, I, I understand your workload's crazy. Our workload's crazy. Let's help each other out here. And that, so it just, it streamlines a lot of communication for the student and for the organization. Thank you, Jesse. And at this time, I would like to thank the entire panel for your, the discussion today and all the, the work that you do for our students. Um, so much I can talk about um, that usually goes unnoticed, but we definitely appreciate your efforts and the support. Um, and again, we look forward to the outcomes, the continued conversation from our summer milk report. And at this time, I'm gonna turn it back over to David. Thank you. All right, thank you all. Uh, it's so great to, to hear that discussion. And just wanna thank, say thank you, of course, to, to, to Dr. Boyd and all, all of the panelists uh, for the perspective uh, and uh, advice and engagement around this really important topic in, in supporting students to pursue post-secondary education in Tennessee. As we look to the academic year ahead, we uh, at SCORE are really eager to engage with partners on the issue of summer melt and to advocate for solutions that enable more students to complete higher education. And given the ongoing complications presented by COVID-19, it's really more important than ever to build innovative and sustainable support systems that provide opportunities to every Tennessee student. Um, the stakes are higher than ever. A post-secondary degree, as we talked about earlier, uh, post-secondary degree or credentials essential for career life success, for economic mobility, uh, and to access uh, the American dream. And every Tennessee student deserves that opportunity. Um, with better transition supports, students like Noah, like Michaela, like Salvador would have earned their degrees by now. And it's likely they would be pursuing career goals and living lives of, of economic independence. And while we highlighted these three students, thousands more just like them face the same hard choice every year in our state. And sadly, many of them are ultimately uh, being forced to delay higher education uh, uh, as, as they think about next steps. We know that once college plans are delayed, they're often never realized. So we appreciate your presence today. Look forward to working with you to stop summer melt in our state. Look, forward, uh, look for a follow-up email um, over the next day or so with a digital copy of SCORE's Stopping Summer Melt Report and a recording of today's webinar. You also have the link to the report in, in, the, in the chat box uh, in, in Zoom. Uh, and the email that you'll get over the next day will also include information on how to order your own hard copy of the report and how to request uh, a debrief or discussion with a member of the SCORE team on this topic as well. Um, SCORE is committed to helping find ways to address summer melt across our state. 
and uh, I'm committed to helping each of you in doing that in your own work as well. We encourage you to reach out so that we can work together to support Tennessee students in pursuing higher education at this important time and hope you have a great rest of the day and rest of your week. Thanks again for being with us.